love you, Clean. I'm just flowing now. All right, so senior high go to camp. So junior or mid high, mid high. Last week, right? How many kids would you have to go, Julia? 15 total, so 13. 15, do they all make it back home or do we? Well, lose a field boy. Was that your first time at Camp Bond? It was. How was it? It was good. Was it? Was good. All right. Did you swim in the creek? I played it, I played it. Okay. One time I've been there, they, they had kids coming out with leeches on them. That was years ago. Mm, I'm not swimming that creek. I'm not going anywhere near that creek. Uh, why? Yeah, why? Why don't you jump in a volcano? I don't know. Matthew chapter 5 is where we're at. I tried to find the picture of uh, Robbie of uh, the costume night. And I, I, I couldn't. Where did you put that? I forget. Was it a text message? Was it? it was in the comments. Okay, that's why I didn't look, I didn't look, look that hard. Uh, the kids dressed up, uh, and our youth pastor was right there in the middle of them. Uh, a very large bumblebee. So that's that's funny. All right, you enjoying the warm weather? Finally, finally, it's gotten warm. Officially, officially, I don't know when summer starts. When does summer officially start? The 21st? The 21st? Of June? June. we still got time. The thing I like about that is the days are still getting longer. The days are still going. And suddenly, suddenly, you know, I, I guess it's pessimistic. After the, 20, the 22nd, the days are getting shorter. You know, I hate that. You know, Fourth of July kind of, for some reason, that represents me the kind of the pinnacle of the summertime. And it's like, oh, it's downhill from there. And then it's school starts, so a celebration there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the parents are all bored. So. Oh, that's great. Well, it's not summer yet, but we're spending time in the mountains uh, hearing the words of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and as he challenged his followers. One of, the, you know, the, one of the most important messages that Jesus had to share was this extended passage, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus is talking to his disciples. We understand that there was a crowd there, a large crowd there. Uh, but you get the idea that this was a, a challenge to his most intimate, personal friends. And Jesus has just declared to them, um, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I, I, I don't know how they responded to that, that, that notion. But at some level, it had to seem comical to think that uh, these gentlemen, uh, whatever the ladies, there were, there were ladies that followed that were there for his teaching and so forth. We know that. But that was just a crazy notion. Um, but yet, uh, they... Those men and ladies became one of the most powerful influences, the, arguably the most powerful influence there has been in the history of, of mankind. I mean, even, even the hardened skeptic could not deny that there was something that happened that made a transforming effect upon civilization, upon people. And it is it's still going on today. Christianity is still leaving its mark. For all the criticism that Christianity suffers, some of the rightly, some of them not so rightly. Uh, our faith has had a profound effect on humankind. Uh, being light and being salt. And, and those, those are challenging words. And in today's section, there are some challenging words as well. Jesus begins to talk about something we probably don't, you know, a word we probably don't use very much. He begins to talk about their righteousness, righteousness. Righteousness. You know, that's something we don't we don't throw around a lot. A word we don't use in our everyday you know, vernacular. Righteousness. Just what is righteousness? What does it mean to be right? Well, simply put, uh, righteousness just means rightness. Rightness. It, it, it is my rightness as it relates to God's expectation for me. How I function in, in life. And how it aligns... In, in God's will. And then we 
go back to those words I've been saying this is our theme for the message on the Sermon on the Mount. The, the challenge that Jesus had is, uh, you know, do not be like them. And over and over again, he's telling his disciples that you are to exceed, to go beyond, to go a different path, to swim upstream, whatever, you know, spin you want to put on it. That their, their conduct, their life, their thoughts would, would go counter against the popular notions of society in their day and, and in our day. And I've suggested to you that it's, it's countercultural. And if you, if you are one of these people that, you know, takes pride to be an individual, individualistic, your own man, your own woman, uh, here are the words, the challenge for you and your personal counterculture movement. Uh, and, and so today, Jesus begins to kind of talk about um, uh, very hand-on practical ways to express your countercultural righteousness. So let's just talk a bit about countercultural righteousness. What is it? First off, we've already heard from uh, the Beatitudes that this righteousness is something that I should hunger for. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be filled. Uh, I don't know if any of us have ever been truly, ever, really, really hungry. Um, you know, I have kind of a habit. When I'm hungry, I eat. That's just sort of the way I live. Um, you know, and sometimes I eat too much. I'm working on that. God help me. He is. But um, same with being thirsty. You know, I've never been to truly, truly, truly. Hungry, hungry. I have fasted uh, a day before. Never longer than that. Um, but to tell you the truth, I really don't truly know what it means to be, to be hungry. You know, a few years ago, went to Swaziland while our daughter and son-in-law were there, and uh, we went out one day into the, the fields and uh, went to homes of people who had uh, victims suffering from AIDS. Uh, Swaziland is being decimated by AIDS, and, and we went to homes where people were, were very sick and very hungry and, and so forth. Uh, I, I remember that we packed a lunch, and it was chips. I think it was a peanut butter sandwich and, and a bottle of water. It was fine. You know, I thought, at lunch, you know, I'll supper, I'll be fine. I'll tell you, I was, I was never more grateful for a meal than I had that day. When we came back from my house, the mother and her adult son, he was, he was, they had very little. We gave them food and beans and lots of stuff. We gave them a bucket of stuff, you know, every time we visited them. I, when I went back to the air-conditioned van, sat down and had my peanut butter and chips and, and my bottle of water. I, I truly, I thanked God for that meal. Uh, really, I wept, I wept. It was, it was emotionally overcoming. Hungry. Hunger, to, to hunger for righteousness. You know, you don't want to go to the grocery store hungry, do you? <laughs> Everything looks good. Everything looks good. It ends up in your cart. Uh, but Jesus is saying that this, this rightness is something that I should hunger for. I would think about that. Hunger for it. Okay, my kind of rightness, he's saying, is something that I, I should long for, I should look for, I should seek after. That my, my life, if I was truly hungry, would my life be consumed with the idea of getting a meal? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're going to be filled. That's challenging. I don't know about you, but it challenges me. Uh, two, here's another interesting point. Righteousness is something that I, that I should be willing to, to suffer for. To suffer for. Suffer for. Uh, going back to the Beatitudes again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for, because of righteousness. For there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when... People insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Who are persecuted because of righteousness. Not only should I, should I hunger for and thirst for this rightness, but it's something that is so valuable to me that I'm willing to suffer for it. <laughs> and again, last Sunday, you remember the message. Um, uh, 
Uh, salt can be biting. Light can be penetrating. The, the inclination is, the suggestion is, is that living with rightness with God can be biting and irritating to people. That's, that's the point, is it not? Why? Because the Bible itself says um, people prefer to live in darkness. This is the verdict, John 3.19. Light has come into the world, but men love what? Darkness. Instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Do you ever walk into a dark room, somebody's in there watching TV or something, they have all the lights down, you know, and the pupils are dilated, they're about that big, they're watching something, and you walk in and you flip on the switch, the light switch, because you can't see anything except, you know. And what do they start doing? They start shouting at you, turn off the light, turn off the light. It's like you've you know, done the worst evil. Ah! <laughs> turn off the light. I, 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 that's a taste of how people uh, respond to the penetrating light of God's righteousness in a dark world. Men love darkness instead of light because their e deeds were evil. So in other words, if you want to live in this rightness with God, don't expect to be on anybody's top ten favorite list. Because you're living in a way that convicts people around you. Now, I'm not saying that you go out and be preachy. You know, that's my job, okay? Ha ha ha, that's funny. <laughs> Thank you. But just living right will bring conviction. You know? You know, living right brings conviction. Young people, you know, don't expect to be the person that's invited to all the parties if you're living a, a long life that's in line with God's will. Because that doesn't fit. That brings light to darkness. And people don't like light, is what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. But every now and then, when you're living in the light, you'll find somebody who's been wallowing around in the darkness for a long time who's tired of living that way. And they're drawn to the light. They're drawn to the light. The light of God's love. This, this is what we're talking about. It is something that I'm willing to suffer for. It's something that I'm willing to, to live a counter with culture. This righteousness with God. And then Jesus begins to describe that this, that what this type of righteousness as his followers are to hunger and thirst for, to suffer for. Uh, the, the Jews, as you probably know, had, still have it really in essence, an elaborate set of rules and regulations which describe for them what a, a righteous man should look like. And, and one of the questions that might have been raised in Jesus' ministry is, is how will Jesus, this prophet, align with the law? I mean, how does he figure with the law, the, the Jewish law? And it's like Jesus wants to set the record straight right at the beginning. Uh, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappeared, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. That's pretty straightforward. That's Pretty rigorous. Verse 19. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Strong words. But what Jesus is wanting to be clear that he would have nothing to do with the idea that his ministry would not support the word of God. Now, the, the old King James Version, I like how it says... Uh, uh, not one jot or tittle shall no ways pass from the law. Not even one of the smallest letter or even the tiniest pen stroke is going to my uh, against. So he's saying that you see the demands of God have not changed. 
And Jesus came to fulfill God's view of the law. And let us be clear, let us be straight, that Jesus completely obeyed every one of God's laws. Otherwise, it doesn't work, people. And, and you'll find well-meaning Christian dummies out there who will tell you that that's not necessary, but it is necessary. He fulfilled every prophecy. He fully obeyed every law. Amen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's important, people, for us to appreciate. He, he was the completion of God's plan for men and women to stand right before God. Jesus fulfilled the law. Every jot and every tittle. And then the next statement would have really troubled the uh, listeners of Jesus' day. Uh, verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That had to shock them. Here were these common everyday uh, simple folk who was certainly not at the level of righteousness that the Pharisees of the teachers of the law would be, how could my righteousness exceed those guys? The Pharisees were famous for their righteousness. The, the disciples must have wondered, how could they ever exceed the Pharisees' righteousness? And that was the only way to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees had calculated the law that it contained 248 commandments and 365 prohibitions. 248 commandments, 365 provisions, and they aspired to keep them all. I like how Paul said it, that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know. He was, he was like faultless when it came to being a Pharisee. Then how could someone's righteousness actually exceed theirs? That would have been the question. But Jesus was talking about their righteousness was something that they, they put on display. And it was kind of like, it was an outer, outer shell. And it was, but there was no real substance within. There, there needed to be something within going on with these people. And to go within was to exceed what the Pharisees and, and the Jesus' law were putting on display. So, so Jesus was saying that my righteousness is something that must come from within. Come within. It's not merely some kind of outward conformity set of rules. It begins from within. The scribes and the Pharisees, you know, they studied the laws and they interpreted the laws. And in doing so, this is important, in doing so they were attempting to limit the scope of it so that they could be sure that they lived and practiced within the range of control. They had to define it so that they could be sure that they didn't step over that line. What they ended up doing, though, important point number two, is the do's were more permissive and the don'ts were less demanding. Let me repeat that again so you just kind of let it soak in a little bit. The do's were more permissible and the don'ts were less demanding. And in many ways, that's kind of what we do. When we talked about living life. Where is the line? You see, I, I want to know where the line is. This is what people say. Okay, can I go this far in my conduct so that I know that if I, so if I step over, I'll know it. In the meantime, i got all this room to work around in. I want to know where the line is. That's an exterior righteousness. But Jesus, over and over in the sermon, takes the law and applies it to the heart. What they're trying to do is, is so that by outward appearances, they fell within the Torah's commands, the outward appearance. And Jesus would say over and over again, you have heard that it was said. Da, 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 da. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you something that goes against the uh, conventional wisdom of the day. Let me tell you what the real truth is. Then Jesus begins to, in his sermon, begin to work out some practical illustrations of what this inward righteousness should appear to be looked like that is coming within. And if the Sermon on the Mount is anything, if it's anything, it's very practical. And you know, and it's hard and a message to be practical. Now, I can tell you this from 30 years of experience. 
that is great to pontificate on all kinds of theological themes. But sometimes when you get down to the practical application of what we're talking about, it becomes a little more challenging. And Jesus is straightforward. And the first practical illustration that he deals with, life illustration he deals with, comes from the Sixth Commandment. Uh, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to people long ago. You have heard what it was said, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. So, we all know that we should never murder, right? Amen? But what the Pharisees said, you, you can call your brother basically anything. But don't kill him. Okay? You see what you got there? I can, I can walk around this area over here, name calling and hate and so forth, but once I get to the killing part, oh, mm, no, don't do that. You know, you call him Raka, you might be answerable to Sanhedrin, but don't kill him. Call your brother anything you want, but just don't kill him. You see, the, the restricted to don't murder actually makes other areas more permissive. Call him anything. Don't kill him. So life illustration number one that we're talking about in Jesus' sermon is anger. We'll deal with lots of life illustrations as we go along. So according to uh, the righteousness that comes from within, unkind words are murdered by the mouth. The unkind words. They're from within. Rakha means uh, empty. It means you know, basically you're calling somebody empty-headed. Boneheaded, numbskull, moron, noodle brain, I don't know, take your pick. You know? <laughs> but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of fire, uh, the fire of hell. You know, when I was growing up, uh, my mom taught me, you never called anybody a fool. Did your mother ever do the same way? No. no. So, you know, that mom, mom, you know, don't ever call anybody a fool. It comes from this. Whoa. But as Jesus is saying here, well, obviously he's, he's taking this matter of the expression of anger very seriously. Unrighteous anger. The unrighteous expression of anger should be avoided at all costs. I, I, you know, that probably hits somebody. You know, you got those people, you know, who are just the sweetest people you'd ever want to meet. You know, they, they would never say an unkind word. They have probably, the last unkind word they said uh, in their life is when the doctor spanked their backside when they were born, probably. You know, they're just so sweet, they're oozing the sweetness, but they're just those kind of people. <laughs> but then you got some people like me who are driving around town. Some dummy turns in front of you or cuts you off or doesn't see the green light and you yell out, Raka! <laughs> <laughs> Do you talk to the people? They can't hear you, but you're yelling at me. The counterculture righteousness that Jesus tells me to hunger for is one that goes so deep within, that goes so deep within that when it comes out, during these encounters, what comes out is totally at odds with what popular culture would normally expect to come out. This is part of what it means to be the light of the world. A city set on a hill. It's different. It's sometimes uncomfortable, but it's right. And it comes from this welling within, this righteousness that's within. Jesus goes on with his practical instructions regarding dealing with your anger. And one deals with how you deal with your brother, one how to deal with an enemy. Therefore, if you, if you are offering your brother at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gifts there in front of the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Verse 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who has taken you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way. Or you may hand, he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. And I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Full sermon there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If 
to get anything out of these illustrations is the necessity for immediate action, immediate and urgent action. Immediate and urgent action. So, so unrighteous anger requires attention and action. Jesus knew the volatile, uh, the volatile nature of anger. It's so volatile, it needs to be dealt with quickly. Deal with it quickly. And that, that takes a, a guidance from within. You see? I call my wife anything. Just don't kill her. You know? Oh. How far are you going? I didn't kill her. Good, you're fine. No. She says, hey, you're not like that at all. You have an unkind word with her. Deal with it. Repent of it. Go into action. Do what it takes to amend, to repent, and repair. I'm hearing a video somewhere. <laughs> Anything can happen if you're not careful. The story is told, you know, you hear these stories, you don't know if they're, uh, they're actual or not, but uh, the story is told about Mickey Mantle, who had a friend uh, tell him that he would let him hunt on his ranch. And one day he took Billy Martin to go hunting with him. <laughs> Billy stayed in the car while uh, Mickey uh, checked with his friend. And Mickey was given permission to hunt, but the rancher asked him to do a favor. His old mule was going blind, and he had become crippled. But the rancher didn't have the heart to put him out of his misery, so he asked Mantle if he would shoot his old mule as a favor. When Mickey came back to the car, he decided to play a trick on Billy, pretending to be angry. What's wrong? Billy asked. My friend told me no honey. Mickey pounding his fish on the dashboard, pretending to be angry, and said, why that guy's got me so mad, I'm going to the bar and shoot one of his mules. And with that, Mickey jumped out of the car and headed for the barn in quick order, took care of the mule, and started back to the car to tell his friend it was a joke. But at that, that moment, Mickey heard two shots fired and found Billy standing over two dead cows. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, Mantle asked. Martin answered, why, I, sh I show him, saw how mad you were, so I wanted to let the guy know he couldn't fool with me either. <laughs> Anger can get out of hand. <laughs> Probably the most surprising advice of Jesus on that is about how you worship God. And when you remember something, you have something against uh, somebody, has something against you. Jesus has very clear directives on, on how to how to deal with this matter. What's the priority? And Jesus says, first go, then come. First go to your brother, and then come to the Lord kind of heart. That's the kind of heart that God wants to worship him. The kind of heart that is willing and wanting to reconcile with anyone who might have cause to be angry against them. So that worship can be unimpeded. The directive is for easy for us to push aside the reason away. But Jesus' worship made us stop and think and ask, is there someone I need to be reconciled with? Before I go to the Lord. Those are challenging words. It comes again from this, this, this inward motivation, this inward heart. These words in the Sermon on the Mount are no doubt some of the most challenging words in the Bible. And one reason is, is that they, they, they're so practical in nature. So practical, and again, they, they're driven home to, again. Countercultures righteousness requires a work of God upon my heart. And people, that's holiness preaching there. I need a work of the Holy Spirit on my life. Otherwise, this is foreign to me. This is foreign to me. Otherwise, I have no capacity to live in adherence to it. I, it it's, it's something I can't do on my own. I need the, the work of the Spirit in my life. 
in order to align myself with the will of a holy God who is expecting from me the kind of action and reaction that he wants me to have that he put forward in the Sermon on the Mount. He gave us the power to change. And thank goodness that if God gives his spirit without but without limit. Without limit. And so this is my prayer, Lord God. You know, and it's it's not like Jesus is surprised with, that you can't live up to the demands. At the same time, that is not to say that he doesn't expect you to do that. And having said that, he is most willing to help you do that. With the cleansing work of the Spirit in my life, in my heart. You see that, people? You understand that? Yeah, Pastor, I got this problem with anger. Yeah, the Lord knows. You need help. They kind of help. You know, I, I, I've got this situation where I need to be reconciled. I don't have the courage. Yeah, the Lord knows. He wants to help. I don't know. What's the situation? Where are you going to put it? The message goes on and on and on and on. And we'll be delving into it uh, this summer. Um, what does this counterculture Christianity, this movement, look like? It, it comes from a heart that it's in line into God's spirit in my life. Needing me directly. Amen? Amen. 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 Jesus, we are challenged by your words, Lord. I'm challenged by your Lord, give us your spirit. Lord, uh, as we sang earlier, the Holy Spirit is welcome here. Heavenly Father. Pastor Rachel illustrated so well how, how easy it is for words to spill out. One of those words might be a rock, a fool, bonehead, I don't know. Once we squeeze them out, possible to put them back in. Help us to be people. Help us to be people who are in turn or in line or in step with your Holy Spirit work in our life. Do a work. Cleanse us from sins, Lord God. Heal us, anoint us, fill us with your Spirit. And help us to be the kind of people who are enabled to live in right step with you as you would help us to be. Jesus, in your powerful name, I ask these things. Amen. Amen.